Hello, Cardinals. Welcome to our third reading of Octavia Butler's Kindred, The Fire. One, I tried. I showered, washed away the mud and the brackish water, put on clean clothes, combed my hair. That's a lot better, said Kevin when he saw me, but it wasn't. Rufus and his parents still had not quite settled back and become the dream Kevin wanted them to be. They stayed with me, shadowy and threatening. They made their own limbo and held me in it. I had been afraid that the dizziness might come back while I was in the shower, afraid that I would fall and crack my skull against the tile or that I would go back to the river, wherever it was, and find myself standing naked among strangers. Or would I appear somewhere else naked and totally vulnerable? I washed very quickly. Then I went back to the books in the living room, but Kevin had almost finished shelving them. Forget about any more unpacking today, he told me. Let's go get something to eat. Go? Yes, where would you like to eat? Some place nice for your birthday. Here. But here, really, I don't want to go anywhere. Why not? I took a deep breath. Tomorrow, I said, let's go tomorrow. Somehow, tomorrow would be better. I would have a night's sleep between me and whatever had happened, and if nothing else happened, I'd be able to relax a little. It would be good for you to go out of here for a while, he said. No. Listen, no. Nothing was going to get me out of the house that night if I could help it. Kevin looked at me for a moment. I probably looked as scared as I was. Then he went to the phone and called for out for chicken and shrimp. But staying home did no good. When the food had arrived, when we were eating and I was calmer, the kitchen began to blur around me. Again, the light seemed to dim, and I felt the sick dizziness. I pushed back from the table, but I didn't try to get up. I couldn't have gotten up. Dana? I didn't answer. Is it happening again? I think so. I sat very still, trying not to fall off my chair. The floor seemed farther away than it should have. I reached out for the table to steady myself, but before I could touch it, it was gone. And the distant floor seemed to darken and change. The linoleum tile became wood, partially carpeted, and the chair beneath me vanished. Two. When my dizziness cleared away, I found myself sitting on a small bed sheltered by a kind of abbreviated dark green canopy. Beside me was a little wooden stand containing a battered old pocket knife, several marbles, and a lighted candle in a metal holder. Before me was a red-haired boy. Rufus? The boy had his back to me and hadn't noticed me yet. He held a stick of wood in one hand, and the end of the stick was charred and smoking. Its fire had apparently been transferred to the draperies at the window. Now the boy stood watching as the flames ate their way up the heavy cloth. For a moment, I watched, too, and then I woke up, pushed the boy aside, caught the unburned upper part of the draperies, and pulled them down. As they fell, they smothered some of the flames within themselves, and they exposed a half-open window. I picked them up quickly and threw them out the window. The boy looked at me and then ran to the window and looked out. I looked out, too, hoping I hadn't thrown the burning cloth onto a porch roof or too near a wall. There was a fireplace in the room. I saw it now, too late. I could have... Uh, safely thrown the draperies into it and let them burn. It was dark outside. The sun had not set at home when I was snatched away, but here it was dark. I could see the draperies a story below burning, lighting the night only enough for us to see that they were on the ground and some distance from the nearest wall. My hasty act had done no harm. I could go home knowing that I had averted trouble for the second time. I waited to go home. My first trip had ended as soon as the boy was safe, had ended just in time to keep me safe. Now, though, as I waited, I realized that I wasn't going to be that lucky again. I didn't feel dizzy. The room remained unblurred, undeniably real. I looked around, not knowing what to do. The fear that had followed me from home flared now. What would happen to me if I didn't go back automatically this time? What if I was stranded here, wherever here was? I had no money, no idea to, of how to get home. I stared out into the darkness, fighting to calm myself. It was not calming, though that there were no city lights out there, no lights at all, but still I was in no immediate danger. And wherever I was, there was a child with me, and a child might answer my questions more readily than an adult. I looked at him. He looked back, curious and unafraid. He was not Rufus. I could see that now. He had the same red hair and slight build, but he was taller, clearly three or four years older, old enough, I thought, to know better than to play with fire. If he hadn't set fire to his draperies, I might still be at home. I stepped over from him, took the stick from his hand, and threw it into the fireplace. 
Someone should use one like that on you, I said, before you burn the house down. I regretted the words the moment they were out. I needed this boy's help, but still, who knew what trouble he had gotten me into? The boy stumbled back from me alarmed. You lay a hand on me and I'll tell my daddy. His accent was unmistakably southern, and before I could shut out the thought, I began wondering whether I might be somewhere in the south, somewhere two or three thousand miles from home. If I was in the south, the two or three hour time difference would explain the darkness outside, but wherever I was, the last thing I wanted to do was meet this boy's father. The man could have me jailed for breaking into his house, or he could shoot me for breaking in. There was something uh, specific for me to worry about. No doubt the boy could tell me about other things. And he would. If I was going to be stranded here, I had to find out all I could while I could. As dangerous as it could be for me to stay where I was, in the house of a man who might shoot me, it seemed even more dangerous for me to go wandering into the night totally ignorant. The boy and I would keep our voices down and we would talk. Don't you worry about your father, I told him. You'll have plenty to say to him when he sees those burned draperies. The boy seemed to deflate. His shoulders sagged and he turned to stare into the fireplace. Who are you anyway, he asked. What are you doing here? So he didn't know either. Not that I had really expected him to, but he did seem surprisingly at ease with me, much calmer than I would have been at his age about the sudden appearance of a stranger in my bedroom. I wouldn't even still have been in the bedroom. If he had been as timid a child as I would, he probably would have gotten me killed. What's your name, I asked him. Rufus. For a moment I just stared at him. Rufus. Yeah, what's the matter? I wished I knew what was the matter, what was going on. I'm all right, I said. Look, Rufus, look at me. Have you ever seen me before? No. That was the right answer, the reasonable answer. I tried to uh, make myself ex accept it in spite of his name, his too familiar face. But the child I had pulled from the river could so easily have grown into this child in three or four years. Can you remember a time when you nearly drowned, I asked, feeling foolish. He frowned and looked at me more carefully. You were younger, I said, about five years old, maybe. Do you remember? The river? The words came out low and tentative, as though he didn't quite believe them himself. You do remember then. It was you. Drowning, I remember that. And you? I'm not sure you ever got a look at me, and I guess it must have been a long time ago for you. No, I remember you now. I saw you. I said nothing. I didn't quite believe him. I wondered whether he was just telling me what he thought I wanted to hear. Though there was no reason for him to lie, he was clearly not afraid of me. That's why it seemed like I knew you, he said. I couldn't remember, maybe because of the way I saw you. I told Mama, and she said I couldn't have really seen you that way. What way? Well, with my eyes closed. With your... I stopped. The boy wasn't lying. He was dreaming. It's true, he insisted loudly, and then he caught himself, whispered. That's the way I saw you just as I stepped into the hole hole in the river i was walking in the water and there was a hole i fell and then i couldn't find the bottom anymore i saw you inside a room i could see part of the room and there were books all around more than in daddy's library you were wearing pants like a man the way you are now i thought you were a man thanks a lot but this time you just looked like a woman wearing pants i sighed all right never mind that as long as you recognize me as the one who pulled you out of the river did you i, I thought you might have been the one I stopped, confused. I thought you remembered. I remember seeing you there. It was like I was I stopped drowning for a while and I saw you and then started to drown again. After that, Mama was there and Daddy and Daddy's gun, I said bitterly. Your father almost shot me. He thought you were a man, too, and that you were trying to hurt Mama and me. Mama says she was telling him not to shoot you and then you were gone. Yes, I had probably vanished before the woman's eyes. What did she thought of that? I asked her where you went, said Rufus. She got mad and said she didn't know. I asked her again later and she hit me, and she never hits me. I waited, expecting him to ask me the same question, but he said no more. Only his eyes questioned. I hunted through my own thoughts for a way to answer him. Where do you think I went, Ruf? He sighed, said disappointedly. You're not going to tell me either. Yes, I am, as best I can, but answer me first. Tell me where you think I went. He seemed to have decided whether to do that or not. Back to the room, he said finally, the room with the books. Is that a guess, or did you see me again? I didn't see you. Am I right? Did you go back there? Yes, back home to scare my husband almost as much as I must have scared your parents. But how did you get there? How did you get here? Like that, I snapped my fingers. That's no answer. It's the only answer I've got. I was at home, and then suddenly I was here helping you. 
I don't know how it happens, how I move that way, or when it's going to happen. I can't control it. Who can? I don't know. No one? I didn't want him to get the idea that he could control it, especially if it turned out that he really could. But what's it like? What did Mama see that she won't tell me about? Probably the same thing my husband saw. He said that when I came to you, I vanished, just disappeared, and then reappeared later. He thought about that. Disappeared, you mean like smoke? Fear crept into his expression, like a ghost? Like smoke, maybe, but don't go getting the idea that I'm a ghost. There are no ghosts. That's what Daddy says. He's right. But Mama says she saw one once. I managed to hold back my opinion of that. His mother, after all. Besides, I was probably her ghost. She had had to find some explanation for my vanishing. I wonder how her more realistic husband had explained it, but that wasn't important. What I cared about now was keeping the boy calm. You needed help, I told him. I came to help you twice. Does that make me something um, to be afraid of? I guess not. He gave me a long look and then came over to me, reached out hesitantly, and touched me with a sooty hand. You see, I said, I'm as real as you are. He nodded. I thought you were all the things you did. You had to be. And Mama said she touched you, too. She sure did. I rubbed my shoulder where the woman had bruised it with her desperate blows. For a moment, the soreness confused me, forced me to recall that, for me, the woman's attack had only come hours ago, yet the boy was years older. Fact, then, somehow my travels crossed time as well as distance. Another fact, the boy was the focus of my travels, perhaps the cause of them. He had seen me in my living room before I was drawn to him. He couldn't have made that up, but I had seen nothing at all, felt nothing but sickness and disorientation. Mama said what you did after you got me out of the water was like the second book of Kings, said the boy. The what? Where Elisha breathed into the dead boy's mouth and the boy came back to life. Mama said she tried to stop you when she saw you doing that to me because you were just some... Um, she said she had never seen before, and then she remembered Second Kings. I sat down on the bed and looked over at him, but I could read nothing other than interest and remembered excitement in his eyes. She said I was what, I asked. Just a strange... She and Daddy both knew they hadn't seen you before. That's a hell of a thing for her to say right after she saw me save her son's life. Rufus frowned. Why? I stared at him. What's wrong, he asked. Why are you mad? Your mother always call black people, Ruth? Sure, except when she has company. Why not? His air of innocent questioning confused me. Either he really didn't know what he was saying, or he had a career waiting in Hollywood. Whatever it was, he wasn't going to go on saying it to me. I'm a black woman, Ruth. If you have to call me something other than the, by my name, that's it. But, look, I helped you. I put out the fire, didn't I? Yeah. All right, then you can do me the courtesy of calling me what I want to be called. He just stared at me. Now I spoke more gently. Tell me, did you see me again when the draperies started to burn? I mean, did you see me the way you did when you were drowning? It took him a minute to shift gears, and then he said, I didn't see anything but fire. He sat down in the old ladder back chair near the fireplace and looked at me. I didn't see you until you got here, but I was so scared. It was kind of like when I was drowning, but not like anything else I can remember. I thought the house would burn down and it would be my fault. I thought I would die. I nodded. You probably would have died because you wouldn't have been able to get out in time, but if your parents are asleep here, the fire might have reached them before they woke up. The boy stared at the fireplace. I burned the stable once, he said. I wanted Daddy to give me Nero, a horse I liked, but he sold him to Reverend uh, Wyndham just because Reverend Wyndham offered a lot of money. Daddy already has a lot of money. Anyway, I got mad and burned down the stable. I shook my head wonderingly. The boy already knew more about revenge than I did. What kind of man was he going to grow up into? Why did you set this fire, I asked, to get um, even with your father for something else? For hitting me, see? He turned and pulled up his shirt so that I could see the crisscross of long red welts, and I could see old marks, ugly scars of at least one uh, much worse beating. For God's sake! He said I took the money from the desk and I didn't, Rufus shrugged. He said I was calling him a liar and he hit me several times. All, it, all I took was a dollar. He put his shirt down and faced me. I didn't know what to say to that. The boy would be lucky to stay out of prison when he grew up, if he grew up. He went on. I started thinking that if I burned down the house, he'd lose all his money. He ought to lose it. It's all he ever thinks about, Rufus shuddered. 
But then I remembered the stable and the whip he hit me with after I set that fire. Mama said if she hadn't stopped him, he would have killed me. I was afraid this time he'd kill me, so I wanted to put the fire out, but I couldn't. I didn't know what to do, so he had called me. I was certain now. The boy drew me to him somehow when he got himself into more trouble than he could handle. How he didn't, how he did it, I didn't know. He apparently didn't even know he was doing it. If he had, and if he'd been able to call me voluntarily, I might have found myself standing between father and son during one of Rufus's beatings. What would have happened then, I couldn't imagine. One meeting with Rufus's father had been enough for me. Not that the boy sounded like that much of a bargain either, but did you say he used a whip on you, Ruth? Yeah, the kind he whips and horses with. That stopped me for a moment. The kind he whips who? He looked at me warily. I wasn't talking about you. I brushed that aside. Say blacks anyway, but your father whips black people when they need it. But Mama said it was cruel and disgraceful for him to hit me like that no matter what I did. She took me to Baltimore City to Aunt May's house after that. But he came and got me and brought me home. And after a while, she came home too. For a moment, I forgot about the whip and the... Baltimore City, Baltimore, Maryland? Are, are we far from Baltimore now, Ruth? Across the bay. But we're still in Maryland, aren't we? I had relatives in Maryland. People who would help me if I needed them and if I could reach them. I was beginning to wonder, though, whether I'd be able to reach anyone I knew. I had a new, slowly growing fear. Sure, we're in Maryland, said Rufus. How could you not know that? What's the date? I don't know. The year. Just tell me the year. He glanced across the room toward the door, then quickly back at me. I, I realized I was making him nervous with my ignorance and my sudden intensity. I forced myself to speak calmly. Come on, Roof. You know what year it is, don't you? It's 1815. When? 1815. I sat still, breathed deeply, calming myself, believing him. I did believe him. I wasn't even as surprised as I should have been. I had already accepted the fact that I had moved through time, and now I knew I was further from home than I had thought, and now I knew why Rufus's father used his whip on, as well as horses. I looked up and saw the boy had left his chair and come closer to me. What's the matter with you, he demanded. You keep acting sick. It's nothing, Ruth. I'm all right, I said. No, I, I was sick. What was I going to do? Why hadn't I gone home? This could turn out to be such a deadly place for me if I had to stay in it much longer. Is this a plantation, I asked. The Waylon Plantation. My daddy's Tom Waylon. Waylon. The name triggered a memory, something I hadn't thought of for years. Rufus, do you spell your last name W-E-Y-L-I-N? Yeah, I think that's right. I frowned at him impatiently. A boy his age should, should certainly be um, sure of the spelling of his own name. Even a name like this with an unusual spelling. It's right, he said quickly. And is there a black girl, maybe a slave girl named Alice, living around here somewhere? I wasn't sure of the girl's last name. The memory was coming back to me in fragments. Sure, Alice is my friend. Is she? I was staring into my hands, trying to think. Every time I got used to one impossibility, I ran into another. She's no slave either, said Rufus. She's free, born free like her mother. Oh, then maybe somehow... I let my voice trail away as my thoughts raced ahead of uh, it, fitting things together. The state was right and the time, the unusual name, the girl, Alice. Maybe what, prompted Rufus. Yes, maybe what. Well, maybe if I wasn't completely out of my mind, if I wasn't in the middle of the most perfect hallucination I'd ever heard of, if the child before me was real and was telling the truth, maybe he was one of my ancestors. Maybe he was several times great-grandfather, but still vaguely alive in the memory of my family because his daughter had bought a large Bible in an ornately carved wooden chest and had begun keeping family records in it. My uncle still had it. Grandmother Hagar, Hagar Whalen, born in 1831. Hers was the first name listed, and she had given her parents' names as Rufus Whalen and Alice Green something Whalen. Rufus, what's Alice's last name? Greenwood, what are you talking about? Maybe what? Nothing. I just thought I might know someone in her family. Do you? I don't know. It's been a long time since I've seen the person I'm thinking of. Weak lies, but they were better than the truth. As young as the boy was, I thought he would question my sanity if I told the truth. 
Alice Greenwood. How would she marry this boy, or would it be marriage? And why hadn't someone in the family mentioned that Rufus Whalen was white? If they knew, probably they didn't. Hagar Whalen Blake di had died in 1880, long before the time any member of my family that I had known. No doubt most information about her life had died with her. At least it had died before it filtered down to me. There was only the Bible left. Hagar had filled pages of it with her cheerful scripts. There was a record of her marriage to Oliver Blake and a list of her seven children, their marriages, some grandchildren, and then someone else had taken up the listing. So many relatives that I had never known, would never know, or would I? I looked over at the boy who would be Hagar's father. There was nothing in him that reminded me of any of my relatives. Looking at him confused me, but he had to be the one. There had to be some kind of reason for the link he and I seemed to have. Not that I really thought a blood relationship could explain the way I had twice been drawn to him. It wouldn't. But then neither would anything else. What we had was something new, something that didn't even have a name, some matching strangeness in us that may or may not have come from our uh, being related. Still, now I had a special reason for being glad I'd been able to save him. After all, after all, what would have happened to me, to my mother's family, if I hadn't saved him? Was that why I was here? Not only to ensure the survival of one accident-prone small boy, but to ensure my family's survival, my own birth. Again, what would have happened if the boy had drowned? Would he have drowned without me, or would his mother have saved him somehow? Would his father have arrived in time to save him? It must be that one of them would have saved him somehow. His life could not depend on the actions of this unconceivable descendant. No matter what I did, he would have to survive to Father Hagar, or I could not exist. That made sense. But somehow, it didn't make enough sense to give me any comfort. It didn't make enough sense for me to test it by ignoring him if I found him in trouble again. Not that I could have ignored any child in trouble. But this child needed special care. If I was to live, if others to were, were to live, he must live. I didn't dare test the paradox. You know, he said, peering at me, you look a little like Alice's mother. If you wore a dress and tied your hair, to, hair up, you'd look a lot like her. He sat down companionably be, uh, beside me on the bed. I'm surprised your mother didn't mistake me for her then, I said. Not with you dressed like that. She thought you were a man at first, just like I did and like Daddy did. Oh, that mistake was a little easier to understand now. Are you sure you aren't related to Alice yourself? Not that I know of, I lied and changed the subject abruptly. Roof, are there slaves here? He nodded. Thirty-eight slaves, Daddy said. He drew his bare feet up and sat cross-legged on the bed facing me, still examining me with interest. You're not a slave, are you? No. I didn't think so. You don't talk right or dress right or act right. You don't even seem like a runaway. I'm not. And you don't call me master either. I surprised myself by laughing. Master? You're supposed to. He was very serious. You want me to call you black? His seriousness stopped my laughter. What was funny anyway? He was probably right. <laughs> No doubt I was supposed to give him some title of respect, but master? You have to say it, he insisted, or young master, or mister like Alice does. You're supposed to. No, I shook my head. Not unless things get a lot worse than they are. The boy gripped my arm. Yes, he whispered. You'll get in trouble if you don't, if Daddy hears you. I'd get into trouble if Daddy heard me say anything at all, but the boy was obviously concerned, even frightened for me. His father sounded like a man who worked at inspiring fear. All right, I said. If anyone else came, uh, comes, I'll call you Mr. Rufus. Will that do? If anyone else came, I'd be lucky to survive. Yes, said Rufus. He looked relieved. I still have scars on my back where Daddy hit me with the whip. I saw them. It was time for me to get out of this house. I had done enough talking and learning and hoping to be transported home. It was clear that whatever power had used me to protect Rufus had not provided uh, for my own protection. I had to get out of the house into a place of safety before day came, if there was any place of safety for me here. I wonder how Alice's parents managed, how they survived. Hey, said Rufus suddenly. I jumped, looked at him, and realized that he had been saying something, something I missed. I said, what's your name, he repeated. You never told me. Was that all? Adana, I said, but most people just call me Dana. Oh, no, he said softly. 
He stared at me the way he had when he thought I might be a ghost. What's wrong? Nothing, I guess, but, well, you wanted to know if I'd seen you this time before you got here, the way I did at the river? Well, I didn't see you, but I think I heard you. How? When? I don't know how. You weren't here, but when the fire started, I got so scared, and I heard a voice, a man, and he said, Dana? And then he said, is it happening again? And someone else, you, whispered, I think so. I heard you. I sighed wearily, longing for my own bed and an end to questions that had no answers. How had Rufus heard Kevin and me across time and space? I didn't know. I didn't even have time to care. I had other more immediate problems. Who was the man, Rufus asked. My husband. I rubbed a hand across my face. Ruf, I have to get out of here before your father wakes up. Will you show me the way downstairs so that I don't awaken anyone? Where will you go? I don't know, but I can't stay here. I paused for a moment, wondering how much he could help me, how much he would help me. I'm a long way from home, I said, and I don't know when I'll be able to get back there. Do you know of any place I could go? Rufus uncrossed his legs and scratched his head. You could go outside and hide until morning, and then you could come back and ask Daddy if you could work here. He hires free sometimes. Does he? If you were free and black, do you think you'd want to work for him? He looked away from me, shook his head. I guess not. He's pretty mean sometimes. Is there someplace else I could go? He did some more thinking. You could go to town and find work there. What's the name of the town? Easton. Is it far? Not so far. The walk there sometimes when Daddy gives them a pass, or maybe, what? Alice's mother lives closer. You could go to her, and she could tell you the best places to go to get work. You could stay with her, too, maybe, and then I might see you again before you go home. I was surprised he wanted to see me again. I hadn't had much contact with children since I'd been one myself. Somehow I found myself liking this one, though. His environment had left him its unlikable marks on him, but in the antebellum South, I could have found myself at the mercy of someone much worse. Could have been descended from someone much worse. Where can I find Alice's mother, I asked. She lives in the woods. Come on outside and I'll tell you how to get there. He took his candle and went to the door of his room. The room's shadows moved eerily as he moved. I realized suddenly how easy it would be for him to betray me, to open the door and run away and shout an alarm. Instead, he opened the door a crack and looked out. Then he turned and beckoned to me. He seemed excited and pleased and only frightened enough to make him cautious. I relaxed and followed him quickly. He was enjoying himself, having an adventure, and incidentally, he was playing with fire again helping an intruder to escape undetected from his father's house. His father would probably take a whip to both of us if he knew. Downstairs, the large heavy door opened noiselessly and we stepped into the, uh, into the darkness outside, the near darkness. There was a half moon and several million stars lighting the night as they never did at home. Rufus immediately began to give me directions to his friend's house, but I stopped him. There was something else to be done first. Where would the draperies of fallen roof take me to them? He obeyed, taking me around the corner of the house to the side, and there was what was left of the draperies laying smoking on the ground. If we can get rid of this, I said, can you get your mother to get you new draperies without telling your father? I think so, he said. They hardly talk to each other anyway. Most of the remnants of the drapes were cold. I stamped out the few that were still edged in red and threatening to flame up again, and then I found a fairly large piece of unburnt cloth. I spread it out flat and filled it with the smaller pieces and bits of ash and whatever dirt I scooped up along with them. Rufus helped me silently. When we were finished, I rolled the cloth into a tight bundle and gave it to him. Put it in your fireplace, I told him. Watch to see that it all burns before you go to sleep. But, Ruf, don't burn anything else. He glanced downward, embarrassed. I won't. Good. There must be safer ways of annoying your father. Now which way to Alice's house?